Um, we have all of his Bruno books. It's been wonderful. So this is book 16. And we're here to talk about Bruno and his many adventures. Martin and I have been out to dinner and had a sort of discussion about what might be going on with Bruno in the future. And you'll be happy to know that he's completing writing Bruno 17. Yes, as we speak. Right. So, Martin, à toi, cher. Bon santé. Right. To all of you. So, is this a Bruno cuvée? You have to hold that up. Or it won't this work. is the fourth. Hello, can you all hear me? <laughs> this is the fourth wine. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> um, There's that is, British voice in the middle of the whole French thing. <laughs> so funny. This is the fourth wine that I've made. I only make it in very good years. And I don't grow the grapes myself. I get them in from various friends of mine who are winemakers. And then with a, a chap called Julien Montfort, who has a, a very, very good vineyard uh, called Chateau Lévesque, um, that I, we make the wine in his, uh, in his cuve, in his, uh, in, in his, in his, uh, in his chez. Uh, in his winemaking place, and um, then we store it for between eight months and a year uh, in uh, in the couve in the in the uh, in the aluminium couve, and then for several months in oak before we release it. And this is um, this is a particularly good one, I think. It's always a mixture, like all classic. Bordeaux grapes, Bordeaux wines, and Bergerac wines. It's a mixture of Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and a little bit of Malbec, which is optional. But I always put some Malbec in there because it was the wine that was served at the wedding of Eleanor of Aquitaine back in the year uh, 1137. Uh, which is a very long time ago, and it's still the name of the of the black wine of Cahors, uh, Malbec. It's, we call it Cot, but uh, in uh, the world knows it as Malbec, and it's a very famous wine in Argentina these days. But uh, I have great fun making this wine, and I felt that I had to do so because um, some years ago I was made. Uh, I had a great honour. I was made into. Um, a grand consul of the De la Vigne de Bergerac, which is the organization of the wines of Bergerac, which was founded in the year 1254, which is, what, 230 years before Columbus found America. And in all of those 770 years, I'm the first Scotsman ever to become a grand consul, so I feel very, very good about that. Yeah. 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 Indeed. It's a great disappointment to me that Martin doesn't travel with his robes because they're really, I mean, he looks he looks like a medieval winemaker is what he looks like. One of the one of the lesser known things about the French, and you have to sort of live there to sort of get this, is that they they love to dress up. And they love to gather in little clubs and have dinners together and eat a lot. And so in the in the Perigord, we have lots of these little brotherhoods, these confrères. So, uh, as I've said, I'm a grand consul of the wines of Bergerac. I'm a magistrat, a magistrate of the wines of the Moravel. I'm a chevalier of le, le, le Raison d'Or, the golden grape of Sauvignac. Uh, I'm on the Jurad of the wines of Dura. Uh, this summer I was made into a member of the Confrérie of le, le Confrérie du Noir, the walnuts, because I use walnuts to make my vin de noix, my walnut wine. Um, I'm a member, I'm a uh, I'm in the fraternity of foie gras. I'm in the fraternity of Pâté de Perigord. Uh, I'm in the fraternity de Truffes de saint Albert. Um, it is an extraordinary... It takes forever. Just every, every one of these things, every three or four months, there's a, there's a dinner that one has to attend. And one of them, um, which you'll find a reference to in the book, is I am a... I am a, a, a chevalier of um, of Chabrol in the land of Montaigne. Now, 
the in the if you have any copies of my collection of short stories, Bruno's Challenge and other stories, there's one about Chabrol in there, which, given my position as a member of the Brotherhood, is virtual heresy, because the official explanation in France of the term Chabrol is that the great Montaigne in the 16th century was fleeing a case of the uh, an outbreak of plague in his area in the Moravel, and he came upstream towards uh, towards Sala and found a refuge in a poor man's home who could only afford to feed him by giving him a bowl of soup into which he would pour a glass of wine. And the man said, this is why there is no plague here, monsieur, because I, I have this system. And when um, when the, the plague had passed and Montaigne was leaving and thanking the man, and uh, he asked his name, and it was Monsieur Chabrol. And so the Conferie de Chabrol is known as the Conferie of Chabrol dans le Pays de Montaigne. However, I dispute this explanation, as do many others. Um, the mayor of my, of my village has always argued that if you go back to the Latin uh, for Cabriolus, which is the Latin for a goat, and it's still the name, Cabrol is still the name that's used in Provence, it means basically to drink like a goat and you get your moustache and your beard wet like a goat gets it. But my view is different. I, uh, I argue very strongly that there are only two, pl two places in the whole of France that call this custom of pouring a glass of red wine into your soup, they call it Chabrol. And that is the, the southwest of France, Bordeaux and the Perigord, and Normandy. And what those two areas had in common was several centuries of English soldiers occupying the chateau, the castles, year in, year out, because for three centuries it was held by the English. And um, the English had to feed their garrisons of soldiers throughout the winter when you know, food was fairly scarce in those days. And they fed them, they sent over barrels of pickled herring. Now, uh, pickled herring is, will keep you alive, but it's not very <laughs> tasty. And um, and so, quite understandably, the English would try and vary it a bit by pouring in some cheap wine, which would improve the taste of the herring and of the wine. Um, <laughs> and if you if you check on the English term for a young herring, it's shad. And the traditional English term for soup, soup is a French word. The English word was broth. Say together. Shad broth, shad broth, shad broth. The defense rests. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon it's an English, it's a version of the, of the chabrol with, with, which came from the English soldiers. Uh, there, are some, there, are some, there are some seats at the front, if you would like. Yeah. <laughs> But I think I find it really intriguing that that in the Perigord region of France we have this this sense of tradition about the food and about the wine. One of my friends who runs a, a place called Chateau Bellingard, uh, which is famous for two reasons. One, it is the site where the first sword blows were exchanged to begin the Hundred Years' War between the English and the French, but also because it's probably the oldest vineyard in France, that on the site of the chateau is an old a carved wooden, a carved stone throne which dates back to Druid times and the horticulturalists and the experts in the history of wine reckon this was the first vineyard in France when the grapes were very very tiny and rather bitter but the Druids would make them into a kind of fluid that they would they would pass around and I just find it extraordinary to think that I am drinking wine that's made on the very spot where it was made 2,000 years ago. I think it's good God. And it's, um, it's this sense of history just pervades everything in the Perigord. We are defined pretty much there by the rivers and the landscape. And they define the foods to this day.
The rivers don't just give us the fish and indeed the, the pike, the trout, the sturgeon. Would you believe we now have our own caviar? from the sturgeon in the Dordogne, you know the river has been cleaned properly again, properly again. But those rivers would traditionally, until the dams were built upstream, would tradition, tr the rivers would traditionally flood these great flat meadows of the, uh, of the valleys. And that was why we uh, became famous for ducks and geese, because these ducks and geese on their long, long flights of migration, they would they would flap their way over the Dordogne area and they would look down and say, oh, look, in all these great water meadows where every spring and every autumn the rivers overflowed their banks. Oh, look, it's Saint-Tropez. And down they would go and breed and have ducklings and, um, and give us eventually the, 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 uh, the foie gras and the, uh, and the wonderful food of ducks. The other thing which has struck me is with great pleasure. I've, been, I've become a, a sort of amateur archaeologist and a great follower of the archaeology of the area. And about six or seven years ago, for the first time, the archaeological scientists were able to assess and to investigate the tartar on the, or the plaque on the teeth of prehistoric skulls to the point where they could actually start to identify what they'd been eating. And no, they didn't live on brontosaurus legs or... Uh, no, no, they, they were close to being vegetarians for large parts of the year. And so you think, what were they eating? And it turns out, and I should have realized this, because when I was in Southeast Asia in the Mekong Valley, I remember being in a place called Luang Prabang in Laos, where they have the annual river festival at the spring flooding of the river. And everything is served on top of a kind of a duckweed, a green, the green stuff that, gr that grows in rivers. And it's fairly tasteless, but it turns out to be nutritious. And that was one of the prime one of the prime uh, one of the prime foods of the Neanderthals and Cro Magnon people twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand years ago. I mean imagine that. And so I've I've become very very, very interested in this whole history of, of food in the area. And um you will find that an awful lot of the recipes that uh, we have in the in the Bruno cookbook are indeed of uh, of some of some venerable tradition. I'm particularly pleased to have found that the first really internationally famous French chef before Carême and and the celebrated 19th century chefs was in the 18th century was a man called Noel, André Noel, who was exported from the Perigord to one of the famous tables of Europe. What had happened was that Frederick the Great, the King of Prussia, was a friend of Voltaire. And Frederick said, look, I've just been building this palace outside Berlin called Sans Souci, which would be a very small palace for me and some chums like you, Voltaire, and there'd be never, never be any more than eight or ten of us there, but I want a really first-rate chef. Can you arrange for me a top chef to come to Berlin and be my private cook? And so Voltaire gets in touch with a man called Noel, who had a reputation in Paris because he, he was sending up to Paris the first pâté de Perigueur, which was foie gras in the center, topped with truffles and covered with uh, a kind of a pork brawn. That was simply in order to keep it fresh enough so he could get from the Perigord up to Paris. And so Voltaire, who knew this man, wrote to him and said, got this offer for you, private chef, king of Prussia, Frederick the Great, what do you think? And Noel thought, well, I'm getting a bit old for this, but I've got this son who's a pretty good chef, André Noel. He went to Berlin, to Brandenburg, as the chef of Frederick the Great, and Frederick the Great fell in love with him. I mean, in a, in a sort of a, a culinary way. And he began writing poetry to André Noël and called him the Caesar of the cuisine. And so, it's amazing to think of it. And I was doing, I sold quite a lot of books in Germany, and I was actually 
at Sanssouci, and I was doing a reading there, and I told this story, and uh, the Germans thought, ah, ha, 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 this long tradition of the color, the food of the Perigord and of and of the King of Prussia. So I love all of this history stuff, but it a lot of it comes into the cookbook, a lot of it comes into my novels. Um, I just find that I find these things genuinely interesting. And if I get interested in something, I want to research it and write about it and get more and more involved in it. And I've never been anywhere in my life that has more history festooned around every corner and every castle and every town than the Perigord. It just shrieks at you. I mean, I can walk from from where I live. I can walk about 10 minutes and I come to a place called La Ferrassi. It's, and La Ferrassi is the world's oldest grave. It's the oldest place we know where human beings buried one another with ritual and with respect. There are eight bodies there, one of them a woman in her 30s, and the pollen is still around her neck from where they had flowers there. There are children there, each head protected by a ring of stones, as it were, uh, and then there's a man there who could not have wa walked for about 10 years. His leg had been completely smashed. They fed him. They kept him alive. He couldn't hunt. He couldn't, as it were, earn his way. But he was taken care of. And that's one of the great definitions of a human community. And it's 73,000 years old. Imagine that. I mean, it's just, to me, it's mind-boggling. And um, I, I keep coming across this kind of thing. If I walk in the other direction, I get to a place called Limay, which is a wonderful old hill, hilltop fortress. Um, the Gauls had a hilltop fortress there. Julius Caesar's legions stormed the place, and he built a Roman oppidum. And then Charlemagne had a fortress there against the against the Vikings. The French and the English swapped control of a medieval castle on the hilltop throughout the Middle Ages. And I, um, when I was first pottering around this uh, this hilltop, I came across a wonderful old deep well. I remember thinking, I'm going to have a body in that well. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, but it, it's the, what really, really struck me about it is you, as you walk down from the hilltop down into this ex lovely old medieval French town with a long, curly, sloping street, and most of the houses are also like little shops because it was a riverside port. Two rivers come together there, the Vizier, the Dordogne, and that meant they could tax it. It was it paid for itself with the taxes on the trade that went by the rivers. And um, But even more to the point, you come down one particular corner and there is a, a tiny little park about the size of where you and I are sitting here. Um, and that park is where, about 80 years ago, they were trying to enlarge a basement, and they came across several hundred small stones, flat stones, about the size of my two hands together, that, this kind of size. On every one of these stones, and there were about 1,200 of them were found, there's either, there was engraved either um, either a, a, a kind of a horse or a, a donkey or a horse, um, a snake, um, a deer, and a boar. <laughs> Some of them have legs sort of scratched out and redrawn and re-engraved, or the tail scratched out and redone. The only explanation that the archaeologists have for this, it was the world's first art school about 13,000 years ago. I mean, imagine that. I mean, you hear this, you just think, my mind has just been blown. 13,000 years ago, art school. This is the Perigord, and on top of that, it's got the best food in France. As my favorite king, Henri IV, Henry IV, the only French king to give his name to a dish, poulet Henri IV, as he said, ah, the Perigord, great food, wonderful wines, and such pretty girls. <laughs> it's paradise on earth. And I think he was right, it really is. Uh, anyway. <laughs>
Sorry. Oh, no, no, it's wonderful. But the, I mean, the cookbook reflects that. But, you know, we should talk just briefly about the geology, because one of the reasons there were all these ancient people there was that it's a limestone area. And therefore, there were caves and uh, overhangs. If you think about the Anasazi up north of us, you know, it's the same thing. It was shelter. Um, and also because of the limestone, it developed the rivers, you know, because it could flow. Mm -hmm. If you've gone to this area, you could go to the museum, the prehistoric museum at Les Aizy, which is uh, fascinating. And um, for a long time, it was thought that the Neanderthal and the cro and others didn't didn't breed together, but now they've decided that all of us actually have some Neanderthal in us. Um, and so that museum, which is in one of your books, at least one, there's a so, blowout uh, scene. I right. know, uh, but there's one that has a sort of terrorist climax yeah. in the museum. Yeah. I was worried you were going to blow it up and then have to explain to the museum <laughs> people why you did that. Ooh, it didn't get, it just didn't get blown up. I, I cleared it with them beforehand. You did? Uh, yeah. And they're delighted now. As a result of that, I mean, because we sell an awful lot of books in Germany, and as a result of that particular book, they decided to put German translations alongside the English translations under the French translation, so it's, and they they got a grant from the European Union in Brussels to pay for that, which I thought was very smart as well. It yeah. is very smart. Yeah. So this is why there are caves at Lascaux. <laughs> there are caves that you can go go into. I've been in a couple of them, and you know, there's actually a little river. Is that um, what is that? Ruby, the oh, that's um, that's the, the the well. There were several with river flowing rivers in them. Um, Pumesac, Ufta Pumesac has got the lake and the flowing right. river. Uh, there's the one down by um uh, Begins with a P, whose name is on the tip of my tongue. Right. Um, we're both getting older, so come, it takes longer for us to remember come, this it, thing. It will come and later. you know, there's part of the um, part of the road that goes to Santiago de Compostela. It goes. Um, the Rocamadour is yeah. a stop. There's a um, there's a French tourism pilgrim way that goes there's the Spanish I'm trying to remember there are like four different routes at least that go to Santiago um, and one goes through Cadua right um, and Cadua Cadua is a, a, a lovely a beautiful um, early medieval uh, early medieval uh, uh, monastery and w it was given by King Richard the Lionheart who was King of England but also um, he was also the Duke of Aquitaine, end of the 12th century. He came back from the Third Crusade um, with a robe that apparently had been the robe under which the dead Jesus had lain for three days before coming back from the dead. So, of course, it was an extraordinary, major, major relic. And it was held, put on display in Cadwa for centuries. And every year there'd be special pilgrimages to the out to Cadwa, the center, to, to go and see the robe and to worship and pray. And miracles were, were ascribed to the presence of this place. Until in 1934, a very intelligent and well-educated Jesuit happened to be uh, stationed there for a year. And he said, uh, th this particular robe, he said, um, do you, does anybody else here speak medieval Arabic? No. <laughs> he said, well, what it says here is there is but one God and Muhammad is his prophet. <laughs> and it was 11th century medieval Arabic, sort of already a hundred years old when poor old Richard Lionheart bought the thing. Um, they now reckon that there are so many pieces of the so-called true cross uh, that are in various sites in France and Italy that, that's enough to build a medieval warship. I mean, it's a, um, the, the, uh, the people of Jerusalem and the Holy Land back in the 11th, 12th, 13th century, they really were pretty sharp in realizing they could sell damn near anything. Nails? Oh, yes. Oh, these certainly absolutely were used to nail Jesus to the cross and so on and so forth. But Cadwa is one of the great examples of a, a wonderful religious fraud that lasted for 800 years. Amazing. So the cookbook is a great place to explore um, the locavore cuisine, so to speak. I want to make the raspberry walnut meringue. That's the, my goal. But there are, there's a tarte tatin. There's um, all kinds of wonderful dishes in the book. So you can feel as though, um, and there are photographs of Martin doing various cooking kinds of things. So it's, it's a great... Um, there is, in fact, one photograph of a real miracle. 
which is of me exclaiming in surprise when my ta-ta-ta actually worked. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, Julia and I, my wife and I, had great, great fun uh, making, this, making this cookbook and indeed learning what we did about the, about the cuisine of, uh, of the region. There's one dish I'm very, very proud of, which is the one I invented. Um, you, many of you will have eaten boeuf bourguignon, which is basically a stew of beef in burgundy wine. And I thought, well, why not in our own Bergerac wine? So I invented something which is a little bit different with mushrooms and so on, with La Chanterelle, um, which I call boeuf à la Perigordine, as opposed to boeuf bourguignon. And I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, I'm also proud of one of the dishes that is ascribed in the novels to Pamela, who is a Scotswoman. And it's a dish I learned at my mother's knee. And it's called fish pie. And it's uh, it's a mixture of smoked fish and white fish in a kind of a bechamel sauce and then uh, hard boiled eggs on top uh, and um, and mashed potatoes, gratin. And it's a delicious fish pie. My my French friends adore it. I make it quite often. One of the and one of the reasons that I learned to really to cook when I when I left home, my mum had made sure I could just about make it on my own. So I could certainly do any kind of omelette, eggs on toast, uh, spaghetti bolognese, uh, beef stew. I mean, the basics and the fish pie I could handle. Anything else was way beyond my pay grade. Um, but then uh, with Julia, I began to learn more and more and more about cooking because Julia, we've now been married 45 years. And in that time, she has, she has had her way with me in, in all sorts of... Uh, so uh, she insisted that at least once a week, I had to cook. And it had to be different every time. Ah, uh, it made a man of me, I can tell you. <laughs> I can tap that story because when I was very young, um, I was a senior at Stanford and married my first husband. And a wedding present that I got from him um, was two volumes of La Russe Gastronomique. Yeah. And inside was a card that said to Barbara, optimistically, <laughs> which I always loved. And I, I learned to make a bomb. I, that was something I could do um, very easily. I have to say that most of the recipes um, in, in La Russe were beyond me. But it's a two-volume leather-bound set. I still have it. Um, and it's wonderful. Anyway, Bruno, you'll be happy to know, continues to cook in the 16th book. And he has his garden and, you know, gathers up his friends. So maybe we should spare a word or two for the actual book. What do you think? Which is the novel? Yes. Yeah. The um, well, I, I was struck when when you picked me up today from from the hotel where I'm staying. Um, almost the very first thing you said after the usual "Oh, good to see you," jollifications, cheer, and so on, was. You talked about the tax regime of South Dakota. I did. I wanted to go into because Martin embedded in this book is some incredible financial advice, which I, I knew nothing advice. about, which I am, well, okay, <laughs> but I am planning to call my trustee's attention to this. So, But that's jumping in. Don't you think we ought to set it up before you talk about the tax people in South Dakota? Or do you want, no, we've got them now. Let's just talk about it. Well, It's, it's part of the plot. It really is. Um, it is part of the plot. I mean, one of the one of the extraordinary pleasures about writing these sorts of books is if I if I get sort of interested in something quite out of the normal way of a French detective story, I can find a way to shoehorn it into the novel. And so I was. I had this character, a Frenchman who had been one of the early generation. Um, of, of guys in Silicon Valley, one of the people in at the birth of, of, of Google, and was paid, as many of them were, in shares and became extremely rich as a result, and had to find a way to protect his money from the French tax authorities. And I did some research and came across this extraordinary uh, a friend of mine, Oliver Bullock, has written a very, very good book about the international tax fraud system. 
that um, there was a governor of South Dakota, South Dakota, a former Marine called Jankovic, who um, became a hero when he was campaigning for the governorship, and he took his he took his rifle along to a hostage situation, which instantly went onto local television, and he he won in a landslide next time, and he was thinking, how on earth do we make South Dakota into a how do we get some tax money? How do we get some finance? And he had this idea, okay, let us make ourselves into a financial center. Now, this was the early 80s, which you might recall a time of very high inflation because the, uh, the Federal Reserve put, put Paul Volcker at the time, raised interest rates to try and stop inflation, which succeeded. Um, but at the time, it was a real problem for banks and credit card companies because under 1930s legislation, there was a limit how much interest they could charge on the credit cards. And they were actually losing money on the credit cards. And so this guy and this governor of South Dakota uh, passed a local state law which spared them from this. Citibank moved its headquarters into South Dakota, and the state never looked back. The next thing that they did was they invented the Perpetual Trust. Now, the Perpetual Trust goes on forever. If you were, have you, let's say, for example, you had a million dollars right now, you put it into this Perpetual Trust, your great-grandchildren would be sitting on something like $200 million because of the miracle of compound interest, which just goes up and up and up. Now, South Dakota has become one of the richest states in the USA simply because of this Perpetual Trust system. Uh, who knew? Anyway, I got into I got interested. In this. I mean, and the book I'm writing at the moment, I'm, I've I've got into the whole blockchain nonsense, and uh, oh, believe me, I mean, trying to get my wrap my head around this complexity, I not at all sure I I quite understand it yet. But I love getting this kind of detail into the books because, well, I it's the kind of silly brain I've got, I guess, and I get enthusiastic about things and start writing about them. I start researching them. But yes, sorry, there we are. That was the South Dakota. Oh, yeah. But, but what, what's fun for the books, I think, is how international they are, despite the fact that we are in a small village, you know, in the Dordogne, Saint-Denis. Uh, and that's certainly one aspect of it. But what I thought was wonderful, and I'm actually planning to go and rent the chateau for two or three nights, um, is that there is a real chateau. If you get our e-news, I gave you a link to it, but you could Google it. And you want to describe it to us? Because obviously you got their permission to kill people there. <laughs> um, yes, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful medieval chateau that was restored a bit in the 19th century. Uh, and it's on a, it's on a, a hilltop overlooking the river Dordogne. And it's called the Chateau de Ruffillac. And historically, it's got quite a lot to, uh, it's, it's got quite a long story. Just on the far side of the river is the Chateau of Fenelon. And Fenelon is one of the, the great names of French history. Um, the, the, the family of Fenelon had been since the 13th century quite regularly the abbots of Sala, the great cathedral town. Um, but this particular Fenelon was, he was born in the late 17th century and he became the father of the Enlightenment. He uh, was, he became a, a uh, he made his name in Paris because of his belief in educating women, or educating girls. And he opened a school for well-born young women in the 1690s, 1680s, which became became very, very fashionable. And Louis the Fourteenth was extremely proud of this on the grounds that nowhere else in Europe were were women being educated like this. And so Louis the Fourteenth made Fenelon into the tutor of his son, the Dauphin, who would be the next king. And uh, Fenelon was not entirely a hundred percent devotedly monarchist. Let me put it that way. In fact, he he was he wrote a book called Telemachus. 
Now, Telemachus was the name of the son of Ulysses in the uh, in Homer's Siege of Troy, and Ulysses came home to his wife Penelope and the son Telemachus. And this book is about the way in which Telemachus is entrusted by Ulysses to a special tutor who takes him around the old classical world to teach him how to be a just and fair and wise and good king. And the name, and this is where we get the meaning of it, the name of this tutor is Mentor, which is how we get the word mentor into our own language. But this book went into every European language. Over a hundred editions of it were sold. It was perhaps the first international bestseller. And the difficulty was, it was a bit liberal and said that the good king had to be fair and just to his people and had to listen to his people and had to keep the law himself. And there was a man called Bossuet, who was a very conservative uh, cardinal who was also the uh, the confessor to Louis the Fourteenth, and Bossuet kept saying, "This is dangerous stuff that this young man is writing, Your, your Highness." Uh, and anyway, so um, so Fenelon is sacked, but his book really became, as it were, the opening of the Enlightenment, cited by everybody, by Goethe and Diderot and Montesquieu and so on. Um, and his castle is just across the river from uh, from from uh, from um, Rufiac. and it's been beautifully restored. It's also where um, Thomas Jefferson, who was a great believer in and a great admirer of uh, of of, uh, um, of 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 this famous of 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 Fenelon, um, he went down to this part of the world to to pay homage at the Chateau de Fenelon, and he stayed at Rufiac, and he would write letters there in the library, and there's a wonderful bust of him there at the desk on which he wrote. And all of the bathroom, the bedrooms have been redone in a beautiful way. And it's owned by a charming couple from Silicon Valley. Um, and <laughs> who had enough money to restore it. Who had enough into money to restore it. Being a B&B, essentially, is the reason I said I could go there. And it turns out they were great fans of Bruno, so I've, I've been invited there a few times. And uh, uh, it's very, and I, and I thought this would be a rather nice place to have, to have a meeting of Silicon Valley types. And because, as you perhaps know, there's a lot of concern, not just in America, but in Europe too, about uh, an awful lot of the state-of-the-art uh, state-of-the-art things that we need in computing are being made in Taiwan. And Taiwan's future looks a little bit difficult. Do you know so, that we actually turned away the guy that is the, he was wanted to start a, a chip manufacturing site here in Arizona, and we turned him away. And he went to Taiwan and created the world's biggest, and now he's yep. back, and he's, yep, but that's why. And, you know, talk about short-sightedness here. I don't, I don't know who was in charge in Arizona, but not a forward-thinking operation. But the reason Probably that this has... Goldwater. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that it was Goldwater. But anyway, the reason that the chateau is important in the book is that there basically becomes kind of a siege situation. Yeah. And because of the way the chateau is built and the grounds around it, Bruno and various um, enforcement agencies are able to isolate these people who may be under threat in the chateau and keep track of them. So I thought there could be worse places than to be held under siege, right? I've, that thought had crossed my mind. And not only did it cross my mind, but um, within walking distance of the chateau itself is an old Roman camp. So for 2,000 years, this particular hilltop's defensive possibilities have been have been quite clear. Right. So we see Bruno um, in a in a kind of different role because it's not so much that he's being a policeman investigating a murder as that he's uh, concerned with security and. Um, you know, all he walks the grounds and he figures out where everybody should be. So where it starts is we're in Sarla, um, which is a, a wonderful, 
beautiful city. I once spent a week there um, with a Northwestern alumni group, and I fell in love with it for a whole lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of those towns that still is medieval. I mean, it's been modernized, but it reminds me of Tallinn, Estonia, and places like that. You, you'll recall that um, uh, when de Gaulle came in, into, came back into power in 1958, um, one of the first laws he pushed through was a law to preserve national monuments. And he got his Minister of Culture, André Malraux, the, a, a novelist, to sort of, as it were, make this, to make this law into a reality. And the place he began to take an entire town and preserve it, but in a modern kind of way, was Salah. And uh, then he did it to Paris, and he cleaned all of the blackened buildings that are now wonderful brown and golden stone and so on. Uh, but Salah was the first masterpiece like this. And... Um, I, I've now I realize I've now said in two or three novels that this is the one place in the world where if you just change the shop windows you could film the three musketeers whenever you want you know it's that's true it's not um, it is and there is a prison there because I remember yeah. touring the prison and in um, there's a restaurant that's pretty good by there there's also um, a number a number of communities called les plus beaux villages de France yeah. and they are wonderful they're also meeting is one of them. Well, it yeah. is. And I have a I have a beautiful set of steak knives with chestnut wood handles and beautiful silver on the handles and so forth that I bought in one of them. You can't drive in them. You have to park and, you know, hike your way down into these beautiful villages. Mm -hmm. So France has done a, a great job in keeping them together. But so what's going on in Sarla is there's a reenactment. And um, the principal the principal um, knight, what's his name? Gis Gisclin? De Gessler. De Gessler. De Gessler. All right. Um, he's uh, riding in on a on a horse, and um, he's like the centerpiece of this pageant that's going to go on. And the horse slips, and he, but he and falls. Things go wrong. Things go very wrong. Uh, and and then, it turns out that this guy is in fact. Uh, if you ever get to if you ever get to uh, to to Sala, go down about five miles to the Dordogne River, and you'll come to a beautiful hilltop town called Dom, which is a, a glorious medieval town. But just a bit further along that same ridge is the French equivalent of Fort Meade, Maryland. It's, their, it's the center of their intelligence, electronic intelligence and monitoring service. It's also the place from which they communicate to their nuclear sub their ballistic nuclear submarines. Um, and it's, it's monitoring much of the world. In fact, a good f one good friend of mine, uh, an English guy who's been there for about 40 years, he went there to be a, a teacher of English in one of the several language schools they have around Dom to make sure that the écouteur, the listeners, can pick up every last bit of whatever they're hearing. And they've got people who have been trained to be able to understand a Bengali speaking English to a Nigerian speaking English. Now, I'm not sure I could necessarily understand that kind of telephone communication, but these French guys can are skilled at doing all this. It is one of the most one of the most top secret parts of Europe, I have to say. Um, but Anyway, I, it's a well-known secret in the area. It's an open secret. So I wrote about that as well. And the, the guy... <laughs> so the guy who is um, the guy who is who is wounded or and perhaps killed at this opening scene of the reenactment of the battle of the liberation of Salat from the English in the year 1370, this man Kekler um, is in fact the head of this particular this particular centre of the écouteur, um, and I also go on to point out that. You'll recall that it used to be said that the British, the sun never sets on the British Empire because it was all over the world. That's no longer the case for us Brits. It is still the case for the French. Because if you go, if you start going west from France, up 
in the mouth of St. Lawrence, of the, of the St. Lawrence River, you get uh, St. Pierre in yeah, Miquelon. In South America, you get Guinea, which is also the current cap the capital of the European Space Program, because it's where the, the French allow the, uh, the, the planes to take off. You go across into the Pacific, and you come to Tahiti and Papite, French territory. You go further south towards Australia, Nouvelle Caledonie, New Caledonia, French territory. You go across to the Indian Ocean, and you have the Ile Réunion, French territory. And in each of these places, oh, and also south of Cape Town, <coughs> between South Africa and Antarctica, is Kerguelen, like the name of Kekela, the this particular chap. It's um, an island. On all of these islands, you have French listening posts. The French intelligence system circles the world. The sun never sets on French intelligence. And Is that I, hard for you to say as a Brit? No. No? No, no. The sun no. never sets on the British Empire. You're okay with it not sitting on the French? Look, I'm... I... I'm a Scotsman, I'm a Brit, I'm a European, I'm a transatlanticist, I'm a human being. I mean, now that Queen Elizabeth is gone, I feel a great deal less of the sentimental attachment to Britain than I did. I still feel some, but not quite so much to Charles, not in the way I did for Elizabeth. Um, but, I don't know, I'm... I. I I'm not that much of a, a Union Jack waver. I mean, I'm very proud of being a Scot and of being a Brit and of being part of Europe and of having spent at least half of my adult life in the United States. I mean, I am not a stranger here. I mean, I may sound it, <laughs> but um, I've lived, what, 30 years of my life here. Um, so... I may not sound like one of you, but you know I know many of your little ways. <laughs> uh, I even like quite a lot of your food. We had a rather good dinner tonight, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. We always do when yeah. Martin's here. Yeah. You guys don't realize it, but most of the authors who come here actually come for dinner. Oh. Which, which the we book actually, store, we actually the book store does not support, but I do. We come for the we come for the company. <laughs> anyway, um, so we have this fellow slips off his horse and is helicoptered away and then bad things may happen and so various people are sequestered uh, in the Chateau de Rishidac and Bruno gets to show off how um, really competent he is in security and more than that we probably can't tell you um, but it does bring in a number of Bruno's um, cohorts from the various other policing and security forces in oh, France, yeah. because Bruno is actually progressed from the village policeman. He's now in charge of the Vézère Valley. So he has a much bigger remit than he used to. He has a much bigger remit, and but he's also now brought in quite frequently into this when something comes up in this area that involves French intelligence. Right. Because he's just worked with them before. Um, and it's great fun for me to get into this particular area as well. And it also helps that you know, there's his great love, Isabel, is herself working in this particular field. Um, and um, I should add that this book was actually written before Russia invaded Ukraine, but it's pretty clear it's coming. Um, I think those of us who, I mean, I spent four years in uh, living in Moscow in the 1980s in the time of Gorbachev and Perestroika, I speak Russian, and um, those of us who know Russia were in very little doubt what was happening under under Putin and what was coming. He's got that whole pan-Slav vision, right, of bringing yeah. it back. So yeah. we also, you'll be happy to know that Balzac is alive and well. Hector is still there to be ridden and is every a, day. And is a father. Yes, that's right. No, not Hector, Balzac. Yeah. Right. No, I know, but I'd progress to Hector, oh, sorry, so I didn't oh, want... There's I not did. a foal, there's <laughs> actually a puppy involved here, right? <laughs> so, uh, those of you who remember Gigi, who, you know, died a heroic death, um, are happy to know that Balzac is there. And then various of the village people, the mayor, one of my personal favorite characters, the mayor is still there and still smarter than everybody else. Yeah, <laughs> he's he's yeah. just fabulous. Yeah, I haven't understood why he hasn't risen to be president of France. 
Well, uh, what, what would be the fun in that compared to running Saint Denis? <laughs> That's right, absolutely true. Um, so, but I'm thinking, you know, we all love the cast of characters, right? It isn't just Bruno, but it's the whole, the whole group there. And of course, it's the food. You know, if you remember Black Diamond, which is the third, I think. Um, you know, it's all about troubles, right? I mean, that's the whole point of Black Diamond. No, 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 that was number three. Trouble. I said that. It number was three, the third. Three, third, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, right. So yeah. you know, troubles are a valuable commodity, but you have managed that's to keep food. Uh, yeah, that was the, it. Was that that book the uh, the one with about the truffles that got me made into uh, a, a honorary citizen of Saint Alvaire? And um, a, one of the uh, one of the Fraternité des Truffes de Saint Albert. So, I mean, this is yet another of these sort of confrérie and brotherhoods where we. Uh, it's basically the French love an excuse to dress up and have a good meal with friends. It's uh, isn't this not true? Yeah. yeah. So, questions from all of you. What would you like to ask, Martin? Feel free. Um, I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, it, Bruno hasn't told me yet, um, uh, but it's clear that all of his friends are sort of pushing him towards towards Florence, thinking that she's just the right kind of girl for him. Um, but Bruno is not quite so sure. There was there was a kind of a magic between him and Isabel that he's not sure he can live without, or that. Uh, can he live with a woman? Can he devote his life to a woman who didn't, who doesn't thrill him in the way that Isabel did? Um, I don't know. It's, uh, I'm I'm very bad. Look, I'm a guy. I'm very I'm very bad at reading women. You see. So um, uh, one thing I should tell you is that uh, we we have two daughters, Julia and I, and we're all together, Julia and. Kate and, and Fanny, uh, two girls, uh, sitting on the terrace and uh, having a sharing a bottle of wine, and Fanny says, "Dad, we all know that there's a there is a model for Bruno. There is an inspiration from Bruno. That's your tennis partner, your chum Pierrot, the village policeman. And I think there's another inspiration, and I think there is." Uh, I think there is an inspiration for a key woman. And I said, really? And Fanny said, yes. She said, look, she said, Pamela is a Scotswoman. Mum is a Scotswoman. Pamela rides horses. Mum rides horses. Pamela's a great cook. Mum is a great cook. Pamela's got red hair. And this month, Mum's got red hair. <laughs> So that means mum is the model for, for Pamela. And Julia said, no, Fanny, absolutely not, not at all. However, perhaps for Isabel. <laughs> and because I know how little I know about women, I decided I'd better say nothing at all. <laughs> um, so... I'm, I'm sure these things will work out. I mean, Bruno will find his way to uh, to the right kind of future, um, and um, I'm sure he will. Yes, but I don't know what it is yet. He hasn't told me. I told you, but I don't count. Right? You're not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> right? We won't. We won't go into our confidential conversation. Right? So, who else would like to ask a question? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch. Oh yes, um, oh yes, several of them are. Uh, the uh, Bruno himself is based upon my village policeman, um, who is my tennis partner, uh, because I mean, I w when I first when we first got the place, which is what 25 years ago or so now, uh, in the Perigord, and I was writing a book, so I was there for a, several several weeks at a time, and my one of my neighbours, the Baron, uh, began taking me down to the tennis club, saying you needed to 
get a bit of exercise while writing. And so every Friday morning, uh, he, the Baron and I and Piero, the village policeman, and Michel from Public Works, a couple of other guys, we'd be down there playing old men's tennis, which is where you have a glass of wine each down by the net, you know. Um, but the important thing was after the tennis, about an hour and a half of that, we then went into the tennis club where the largest room was the kitchen and we prepared lunch for ourselves. And the Baron would bring along steaks, Bruno would bring, Piero would bring along truffles and eggs from his garden. I'd bring along, uh, I'd do a whiskey tasting, Scotch whiskey stuff. And a great time was had by all. It went on to about five o'clock in the evening. And um, that's is where I, then the mayor would come along. So this is where I began to get the cast of characters. There was the Baron, there was Piero, there was the mayor. Um, so that's how it got going. One thing I do insist, though, is that none of the women in real life are models for the women in Bruno's life. Uh, they're all figments of my imagination. And I say that to Julia, and I say it to our daughters, and nobody ever believes me. <laughs> Perhaps a somewhat unrelated question on the Paranoid, your previous comments regarding the flat stones that were found with the animal. Yeah. Do you feel there's a relationship directly between that and the art of the Lascaux Cave? They are between that and the... Uh, and the artwork in the Lascaux Cave. Oh, well, it's, it's clear that there was a long tradition of, of decorating the caves, not just with paint but also with engravings and so on. And this is a tradition that keeps coming back and keeps being reborn. So Lascaux is about 18,000 years ago. These flat stones are about 12 to 13,000 years ago. Uh, Kobe is about 28,000 years ago. So whether uh, it's very hard to be certain what happened in the gaps between these peaks of activity that we can track. Um, but uh, uh, particularly because an awful lot of the engravings in caves, it's very, very hard to be sure about the dates of the engravings. Um, but it's, it's clear that this was, this was something extraordinary in this area because there is nowhere else in the world we have anything like this concentration of engravings and painting. There's about 130 engraved caves in the Perigord region and about 24 painted caves. And it's not just, it's not just Lascaux. There's one called Fond de Gaume, which has, it's, they're hard to see, but there is one particular series of images of a reindeer which is, which is sick or dying and another reindeer is sort of giving it a kiss or a lick with incredible tenderness. And then uh, below this, there was sort of a ledge and a, a, a declivity. And inside that declivity are lots and lots of babies and little children's handprints. And you can almost see them playing with the paints and putting their hands while mum and dad are doing. The other thing that's important is until it's only about 20 years ago that people even began to accept the possibility that some of the artists might have been women. And we now know that a lot of them were because women's, uh, the proportion of the length of fingers tends to be rather different in women than in men. And from these handprints, it's quite clear that an awful lot of the work was being done by women. Thank God it's being recognized at last. But, um, and I'm proud to say that in the very first novel I wrote called The Caves of Perigord, came out over 20 years ago, there's a woman artist in there. So I was ahead of my time. Actually, it's just because I'm married to Julia and I know my place. <laughs> there's a wonderful cave. I can't remember the name of it. But when you go there, you have to travel 
an enormous long way in. Rufiniac. Is it Rufiniac? Rufiniac, where you have the little sort of train that takes you in. Yes, and you go in on this little train, and it's absolutely pitch black when you finally get in there, and you recognize that they did that painting when they were carrying. And they, they, we've talked about this before. They figured out that they had perfected light that wouldn't smoke up the walls, right? Yeah, they did. I mean, when you think about it, you, you can see this at Lascaux, because it's deep underground. It must have been completely black inside. And it's white chalk. So if they'd gone in with ordinary torches, the smoke would have blackened the cave walls. No. What they did, they found the only technology that would work, that would give light without smoke. And they made little stone lamps with declivities in them, rendered reindeer fat with a juniper twig as the as the wick and that burns with a clear and smokeless light the other thing they invented was scaffolding because at lasco an awful lot of the paintings are on the ceiling and they had to build scaffolding which meant it, inventing the idea of put, building these sort of wooden structures but also inventing the knots and the kind of string that would hold all this stuff together Lying on their backs, like Gabriel and Law were storing a painting somewhere in Venice. One of they the had to hike a really long yeah. way in at Rufiac, oh, though. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, I mean, it's a, it's a you, have to, you take a little train to get to where the site is. Yeah. So I was trying to figure out they whether they carried those lights or whether they waited and lit them when they got wherever they were going. We don't it's know. amazing, um, but it's uh, it's about a, it's a kilometer to go right all the way. So in. you can go there now, but Lasco they've created a replica of it. You can't actually go oh, into Lasco. But they've made it this new yeah audiovisual modern. Oh, have they? oh yeah, there's a new. They put a huge amount of money into it. They put about sixty million sixty million into modernizing with a new visitor center and so on, Lasco, and some of the stuff that they've done is extraordinary. I'd never before quite realized how many engravings there were in Lasco, because you only have eyes for the painting. But when they in, they have special uh, special uh, galleries that sort of highlight the actual engravings, um, they've recreated some of the other deeper caves as well, including the one, the famous one that I write about in, in the caves of Perigord, which is um, the guy wearing the eagle's head and has an eagle's beak and he's dead, and but he's still holding a spear which is penetrating the belly of a bison and its intestines are falling out. He's got this sort of bird's head and he's got this huge spiky erection. Like a, I don't know, like some, it, it, it's an ex, a, f- a frightening kind of thing. Um, and that is, there's a, a whole a whole gallery now devoted to try and understand this and the, the other things beside it. They think it was to do with a medicine man, a kind of a shaman, um, wearing some kind of headdress and so on. All very, all very, very strange. And his, um, the staff, the spear he's holding has got, has got a bird perched on one end of it, or a carving of a bird. We just don't know. One of the things I love about this is that how many other historical things come into it, because Lascaux was was discovered, rediscovered, in the autumn of 1940, when the Germans had already conquered France, and they were occupying Paris and northern France. And this part of the Perigord was part of the Vichy France that the Germans were not occupying. But the, when the young boys from Montignac found there was a storm, the tree comes down, um, a dog goes down into a hole left by a falling tree, dog disappears, boy goes after dog, gets down, lights a cigarette lighter to look for his dog and suddenly thinks, Jesus Christ, he's in the middle of the great cave of Lascaux. And he comes out and they tell their schoolmaster, he and his fellow schoolboy mates, they tell their school teacher who comes up with the local mayor and they think, wow. And so the school teacher writes to the Abbe Breuil, who was a churchman who was at the time the great archaeologist of, of, of Europe. And the Abbe Breuil was only, I think, the fifth or sixth man to come and see Lima, to come and see Lascaux. 
and he goes back to Paris and he gets in touch with a friend of his, an artist who had consulted the Abbé Bray when he was interested in prehistoric paintings of various kinds and the history of painting, and this artist was called Picasso. So about the eighth or ninth person to visit Lascaux is Picasso. And he comes out and he says, we have met our masters. We have learned nothing in all of these thousands of years. Pic now, the story doesn't end. Have you ever wondered why it was that Picasso, anti-Nazi, communist, the guy who painted Guernica, the biggest condemnation of the Nazis of, uh, from the Spanish Civil War. How did he manage to live and work in Paris throughout the Nazi occupation without ever being touched or bothered? It was because of a man called Ernst Junger. <coughs> you probably all heard of the novel All Quiet on the Western Front by Eric Maria Remarque. The bigger seller in Germany in the 20s and 30s was called Storm of Steel, Stahlsturm, by Ernst Junger. It was Hitler's favorite novel, because it's about the same area of the Western Front against British troops where Hitler was based. And Hitler was gassed in the course of the First World War, and so was Ernst Junger. Hitler adored this book. Junger was an aristocrat who despised this jumped up this little Austrian corporal. Nonetheless, Hitler said, I want this guy to be the Wehrmacht's ambassador, the German army's ambassador to the intelligentsia of Paris. Because if we can win over the intelligentsia like Jean Cocteau and so on, then we will have France. And so Ernst Jünger is sent to Paris, unlimited budget, has a suite at the Crillon Hotel, and every time that the uh, that the uh, Gestapo says, we want to go and have a look at this, uh, this painting geezer, Picasso. No, 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 says Junger. And when they, when they say, we want to go and see this American Jewish woman, Gertrude Stein. No, 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 no. That would interfere with my project of winning over the French intelligentsia. Uh, Ernst Junger saved Picasso and so on. Anyway, so... <coughs> Um, Picasso gets back to Paris and Junger comes into the studio and Picasso says, you're not going to believe this. I've just come back from Lascaux. You've got to go down to the Perigord and see this. And so Junger arranges to go down in his uniform, a German officer and so on, and he goes down with a colleague, a man from, an officer from the German medical service who had been a well-known chemist in Germany called Dr. Hoffman. And down they go to Lascaux. Now, those of you who were around in the late 1960s and early 1970s might remember the name of Dr. Hoffman as the inventor of LSD. So I have this mental image of Ernst Jünger and Hoffman. Wow! Heavy! As they go around Lascaux. I mean, you couldn't make this up, could you? I think we should end on that. I mean, we can't get any better. So please give Martin a hand and thank him very much for coming tonight. It's always it's always a pleasure. Usually he's here in the summer when it's so hot, but this is very nice that so he's had a beautiful evening this evening. So I think that, that Bruno and the cookbook together make a really great combination, but you could give the cookbook to people who don't actually read Bruno and